Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and we're here for number episode, hello, 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 episode number episode 256. Pulled a Drew right there if you didn't notice. Uh, here we're going to talk about pilot nibs and the differences between some of them, uh, women pen makers, and uh, if my kids are going to take over Goulet pens one day. So hope you enjoy this episode. I got nine questions and I'm going to try to be concise, <laughs> though it's not my strength. Whenever I say I'm going to try not to, I usually do worse. Uh, but anyway, this week we had some family time. Rachel's parents came into town. It was very nice, very relaxing. Uh, it was good. You know, we, we pretty much me and Rachel's social activities is family time because um, we work hard and we family hard. So um, that was cool to get to see them. Got to see them. they brought some like emails that I had typed them from like 2002, six months after Rachel and I had met. So it was funny getting to see, you know, like words that I had written back then, I guess. Uh, I hadn't discovered fountain pens at that time, so email was a, a more efficient manner of communication back at that time, but uh, Rachel and I had a lot of emails and stuff that we saved from back in the day. We were like so head over heels, we would write each other poems and songs and all kinds of stuff, real sappy stuff, but you know, we were high school sweethearts and we were long distance from each other, we were about two hours apart, so uh, anyway, it was just kind of fun taking a trip down memory lane. Uh, what else have we done? Let's see here. My bike injury is largely healed completely, and so I'm getting back on the bike, doing that more regularly. The weather's been nicer, so that feels pretty good, getting to do that, spend some time outside. Um, as a leadership team, we, um, if you got our email newsletter, I talked about this in the personal message, but we got to volunteer at Rise Against Hunger, which was pretty cool, getting to pack up uh, meals for hungry kids across the world. So that was pretty rad, getting to participate in that. Uh, really enjoyed that more. I mean, I knew it was going to be good, but I actually enjoyed the process even more than I thought I would. So feels good, warms the heart, very much enjoying that. Um, we've got a bunch of sales that are going on right now, kind of through the summer. This tends to be a little bit slower time for us. We have a lot of kind of just extra inventory across a lot of different products, a lot of different brands. So we're just trying to lighten the load a little bit because just in the big, big, big picture, um, you know, we usually get a little bit slower in the summer and a little bit busier in the holidays. So we try to, you know, free up some of the stuff that we're kind of sitting on for a while, um, give you some good deals and some make some things exciting uh, during a time where maybe normally pens wouldn't be the foremost thing on your mind, um, but get you some good prices and then um, that allows us to then buy up for more exciting things in the holidays. So that's kind of what's going on. It's nothing really as a catalyst. The company's healthy and everything. We're just trying to be a little proactive there. So we got some good deals for you. Uh, related to that, in right now on Monday, Rachel and I talked through how we're changing some of the way that we call things that are on sale, right? So instead of having closeouts be a separate thing from some of our sale items, everything is just now in sales and deals. So you can go to one place, see all the deals in one place, uh, and then uh, we're giving um, descriptions under each product as to why it's going away. Is it discontinued from the manufacturer? Is it still going to be made, but we're, we're just not going to carry it anymore? We're trying to give you that context on a per product basis. A little more work on our part to manage that, but I think it'll help you out and help clear up some confusion if there's ever been any in the past. I've uh, got a couple new pens that have come this week. Nothing too, too crazy. Not a ton of new products launching right now. Um, so, uh, but one thing that we, I think, will have gotten in by the time this video publishes, um, I, was, I was hoping we would get it in in time for when I filmed this video on Wednesday. Haven't gotten it in yet, though, but it's the new Monte Grappa pen. So this is the, uh, I'm going to try and pronounce it right, Emiraglio. I think that's right, Admiral in Italian. Um, so this is a new pen that they have that has sailor nibs on it. Very exciting kind of thing. Um, you know, we don't often get an opportunity to sell a pen with a sailor nib on it. Uh, we're not getting very many at all. But if you're interested in that, I, I, I did have the opportunity to write with one sample ahead of time. You know, it wrote great. It's not any like, you know, crazy different experience. To me, it feels a lot like a Yovo 18 karat nib. And it kind of looks like that style. It looks about like a Yovo, Yovo number six nib on that pen. It does write very nice, has some line variation to it smooth. So I think it's going to be a really nice pen if you're interested in that. Again, if you're looking for pen in that like thousand dollar price range, um, you know, it's it's up there, but it's pretty cool. And it's a neat collaboration, neat uh, history behind that pen. So you can learn more about that on our site. Uh, and then completely swinging the pendulum back to the affordable range, we have the Jinhao 51A, which we have a few different color variations of these. Drew and I talked about these in right now on Wednesday, so I will not belabor the point, but very exciting, extra fine nib option in the eight to fifteen dollar range. So you know, you can pick up an Amiraglio and you can pick up a 51A and uh, then you can stop buying things because you've spent a lot of money. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, next week we are going to be taken off from Q and A. Have a lot of just like vendors coming in and visit. It completely wrecked my schedule, and so it was a good thing. Very very worthy time, but I just, I could not get time in my schedule uh, to do Q and A like normal. So you know I'm just gonna just gonna slow down a little bit. The kids are getting off school. We got a lot of stuff personally going on. So I'm just gonna like you know what I normally normally I'm the one that's like. No, I have to do a Q&A. It's got to happen every week. And Rachel is often like, you know, you can take a week off if things are crazy. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you're probably right. So uh, for my own mental health, take a next week off. Nothing crazy that's going on. Just, you know, we're taking a week off. That's all. So may do some of that in the summer just as it's practical. I will be doing a little bit of traveling in the summer. Um, but uh, I'll try and keep it going as much as I can. But just could make it happen next week. So no Q&A uh, for the next week. All right. That's all I got. Let's get into the questions, shall we? Starting out with pen and writing questions. Nine questions to go. I'm seven minutes in. We're going to make this thing happen. Okay. All right. SB5687 on Instagram. Besides cosmetics, is there any difference between the nibs on the Pilot Custom 74, Custom Heritage 92, and the Custom 823? Or is the difference in the pens just the filling mechanism? Okay. That's cool. I love talking about these pens because they're all phenomenal writing pens. And uh, specifically, the 92 gets overlooked a lot. So I wanted to uh, show that. And it just so happens I'm adding a 92 to my collection uh, very recently because we wanted to photograph it with some ink in it. And, you know, that was enough of a catalyst <laughs> to say, yeah, you know what, I should probably have one in my collection. We're going to ink it anyway. You know, we can't, can't sell it as new, so I should probably just have that. You know, it's the only pilot piston filling pen that we have, so we should probably have it. Anyway, I digress. So looking at the three pens, right, Custom 74, this is my famed blue custom 74 first golden pen that i ever had love it love it love it love it love it love it okay so that pen has what pilot calls their number five nib and actually has a very very tiny number five on here i will not try and show it to you because i just won't be able to um, but anyway it all you also know on the custom heritage 92 that it has a pen with a number five nib you can see that the nib is pretty much the same size it's because it's the same nib in fact if you are really really um, brave and wanting to violate pilot's recommendations for a warranty service, uh, you can yank the pens out of the nibs out of here. They're friction fit, but pilot does not want you to take them out. So be aware of that. You're not supposed to do this. I'm doing it because I am going rogue and because I'm not going to try to return these pens to pilot uh, if I screw them up. So anyway, you take them out. The feed setup is the same. The nib itself is exactly the same. In fact, you, in theory, if you really want to go rogue, you can swap the pens between, swap the nibs between these two pens, but you shouldn't because Pilot says not to, right? Okay, so that can happen. Boom, you can take those out, but you shouldn't. And uh, yeah, pens, nibs are exactly the same. So the writing experience is exactly, exactly the same between these two because the nib and the feed is exactly the same. Um, so largely the difference between you're gonna get between these two pens is aesthetic, right? Even the size of the pen is pretty darn close between each other. So it's really just a matter of that piston filling mechanism and then the caps. I'm just curious, will these caps fit on each other? That would blow my mind. I've never tried this. Let me see. <gasps> That's crazy. Franken pen. <gasps> you can actually swap the <laughs> That looks crazy. Wow. This one in particular, this Heritage 92 with the Custom 74 cap, looks truly bizarre. It would probably look less bizarre if I had the clear version of both, but anyway. The Heritage 92 only comes in clear, so this is your only option for this bad boy. But wow, look at that thing. Okay, so um, the cap is exactly the same. Uh, it's literally just like squared off instead of rounded. Okay, the grip feels exactly the same, uh, same design. This is a little more translucent, it's clear, and it's got a piston. That's your only difference, and it's more expensive. So that's the only difference there. Not a big deal. Now the Custom 823 is a little more different. So these have Pilot's number five nib, which is different number five than all the other number fives out there. It's their own sizing standard. It's different. So if you look at these nibs, the Custom 823 is larger. That is their number 15 nib. It's kind of more equivalent to a number six-ish in size of the European size nibs. Uh, and so there you can see the difference there. Uh, and in terms of actually how it writes, it's basically kind of the same. It's about equal softness, about equal flow and things like that. So really all these pens write really, really nicely and feel about the same. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much what you're going to get. So there is more of an aesthetic difference, but the writing feel is going to be similar. Now I'm going to kind of edge one other one in here. This is the Custom 912, which is not like a 
vastly popular pen, but this one has the number 10 size nib, so I'm trying to line all these up for you. So the number 10 size is kind of in between the number 5 and the number 15 Pilot. Uh, aesthetically, very similar, the same pattern on the nib and everything there, uh, and uh, nib feel is exactly the same, but it's slightly different size. So aesthetically, the nib is a little bit different. Um, there's some subtle differences on the pen design itself. Fit and finish on these is phenomenal. Of course, the biggest difference you're going to have on this custom 823 is going to be the vacuum filling mechanism. And then the amber color is unique to the 823 as well. And it comes with a bottle of ink that you can only get with the 823. So, uh, you know, if all that stuff adds up into something kind of cool, so go, f go for it. For me, the custom 74 is kind of the best, like, deal for this type of writing pen. I mean, obviously, you can, get, you can get the E95S, which has a whole different nib setup, a little bit springier. It's got an inlaid nib. The pen itself is smaller, so that's kind of different. You have the Vanishing Point, which has a kind of a different setup, too. Nib is not as soft, necessarily. This one has got a nice, nice balance of, like, full-size pen, nothing crazy with the filling mechanism and stuff like that. Um, takes the, the, vac, the vac, sorry, the Con70 converter, which is nice. Um, but yeah, and then uh, most economical, too, out of the, the bunch that we're talking about here. The Heritage 92 is a little more expensive, 912 is a little more expensive, 823 is a little more expensive. They all write great. Um, it's just, you know, there's subtleties in the rest of the pen design. So there you go. Hopefully that helps you out. And then other names get even larger from there, like if you go to the Custom 845 or the... Um, you know, Yukari Royale or the Emperor, the nibs just get even bigger from there. All right, forget Mentostal on Instagram. Forget Mentostal is on Instagram. When I do uh, maintenance on my Twisby 580s, how do I know when it needs it, referring to the tools that come with it? Okay, so basically, how do you know when your Twisby needs to be maintained? Um, well, when you use it and when it feels like it needs to be maintained. I mean, that's kind of an obvious answer, but um, if you're using your pen and you're able to fill it and clean it and everything like that, some people, you know, if there's, it's a demonstrator pen, so if the ink is kind of sticking to the sides or anything like that, they may want to disassemble it, use a Q-tip, kind of scrub it out. That's fine. You can do that. You don't have to do that, though. It's, that's really an aesthetic thing. Um, what will happen over time, and then this is kind of like over like six months, a year, maybe even more, um, is a silicone grease will kind of wear away, and uh, it'll start to actually feel kind of stiff. It'll either wear away around the seal that is happening right here. These come pre-greased, so they're ready to go for quite a while. And it's got a double seal on it, so it's really pretty good. Um, and it's greased on the piston rod itself, too. But if you are taking it out and reassembling it a bunch of times, or um, just over time as you're using it for a long time, uh, it could be that it needs to be re-greased. So that's why Twisby includes that grease. They include the wrench inside the box. It's in the bottom of the box, if you if you didn't know that and you have one of those already. Um, so you can just do that, you can just re-grease it. The only one that has kind of a caveat for that, the 580, is if you have the 580 AL or ALR, that one's a little different. The grease that they use is slightly different. And um, I know they have told us specifically um, that you really just shouldn't mess with the grease that's on that piston rod. It's like kind of a white grease. You don't try to take it off and you don't want to mix the regular silicone grease that comes in with that white grease. So don't use that regular silicone grease on there. This is some kind of thicker grease. If My guess is it's some kind of like lithium, like a white lithium grease or something like that. But I don't know officially from Twisby like what grease you should re-grease that with. I'm gonna to try to find that out, but I wasn't able to in time for this specific Q&A question. Um, just know that you don't want to grease the 580 AL or ALR piston with the silicone grease that comes with that Twisby. Um, so there you go. But you can do the piston seal, the black part there. You can use that with the silicone grease that comes with it. Okay? So, boom. That pretty much, I think, answers your question. All right. Gnome's Journal on Instagram. What is the minimal required nib size for an alteration such as a stub or architect grind? Okay, this is a good question because if you're going to take your pen to a nibmeister, if you're going to go to a pen show or something like that, um, you may be shopping for a pen specifically for that purpose, or you may have a pen in your collection you're like, I never use this broad, or I never use this random pen. Maybe I could get this thing ground to something I like, and then it would like give new life to the pen. That's cool. Like, by all means, you, you should consider that. Um, oftentimes, the Nibmeister will um, dictate their own thing, because technically, technically, you could do it on any nib size. Um, 
it all depends on how much variation in your line width you're going to want because both of these nibs you mentioned, a stub and an architect grind, the stub is where you take a round ball and you grind it like this, so it's fat on the downstroke and thin on the cross stroke. Um, and the architect is kind of the opposite, like architect kind of uh, is more of a blade, uh, and that will be thick on the cross stroke and thin on the downstroke kind of opposites, opposites of each other. Grinding technique is completely different for the two. Not every nib meister may offer both of these, or they may have their own kind of flair that they choose to do with it, and that's fine. So they're really gonna be the ultimate authority as to what they feel comfortable doing on whatever said pen. So really, you should ask them first. If you're like, I have this vintage Parker medium nib, and then you say like, you know, can you grind this to you know, a cursive italic or a stub or an architect or whatever, they should be able to tell you what they can do, or they may have information on their website as to what they could do. Um, but yeah, it would be a shame if you bought like a brand new pen and then you brought it to them and they were like, no, I can't do that. And you're like, well, what am I gonna do now? Um, so that being said, with them being the ultimate authority, um, you know, with an architect especially, you can go as fine as you wanna go really, but broad seems to be kind of the sweet spot um, in terms of getting that really good line variation. Uh, medium you can do. I see less fines and, and really no extra fines with that architect grind. It's, it's very difficult to grind on that small of a surface, that particular grind, because there's a lot of compound cuts that you have to make. Um, and then when it's that small, you really can't even tell a difference anyway. It ends up just kind of looking round. So it's a shame to go through all that extra work to try to do that, to not really see much benefit. You have a little more play with a stub or a cursive italic. Um, a broad or a medium uh, is pretty good. They tend to be a little more popular. You can go a fine or an extra fine with that. I've seen some of those for sure. Um, particularly if you have really small handwriting and that's kind of your thing, you may want a fine or an extra fine stub. And then you will, you will see that line variation written very, very small. Um, I've seen that. Um, I believe Pen Addict, Brad Dowdy, has some cool pens that uh, have been ground like that, uh, kind of custom, uh, that, look pretty, that look pretty rad. So, um, you know, you can do anything, but again, I think most people, you're going to want to go with a medium or broad. Sweet. Next question is from JD on Instagram. Uh, recommendations for pens for fountain pen. Uh, sorry, recommendations for fountain pens for doctors, medical students, uh, people who need a solid everyday pen to slip into a pocket, maybe clip to a lanyard, which is easy to whip out and write with on the go, is reasonably durable but not too expensive in case someone nicks it. Um, so, for the criteria for answering this question, I. I kind of took what you said and maybe added just a couple of thoughts. So my criteria that all of these pens that I'm about to talk about meet is um, it's got to have, uh, of course, everything that you just talked about here. It's got to be, you know, pretty solid. It's got to have a nice clip um, and then uh, durable and not too expensive, right? Uh, and then also beyond that, I wanted something that has, um, let's see here, a pretty usable clip and then maybe has some nice color options as well, okay? So uh, let's start out with the Lamy Safari. So that one is a very popular uh, pen in this range. You know, it's in that $30 range. So some that may or may not be considered like kind of an affordable throwaway pen. So this is kind of like on the nicer end of the pens that I'm gonna mention here today. Um, the reason I mention this is because it's a very commonly talked about like total workhorse pen. Very durable, it comes in a lot of different colors. So you can get something that kind of stands out or matches your vibe, whatever you got going on. Um, and then uh, the clip itself is actually highly functional. You know, it's, it's got a good amount of travel to it. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to clip and unclip on whatever clothing that you're dealing with and whatever thickness of clothing. So if you have like a, a thick jacket or something like that, it can go pretty in and out. Um, and it's very sturdy as well. It's not just kind of pulling out of your pocket. That clip is pretty darn secure. Um, so that's definitely a good one, way to go. It's not too, too expensive. It's got a snap cap. Um, and then, uh, you know, you get some nib options there too. Going to something like the extra fine or the fine range is probably better for when you're working on charts and things like that. It's in that 30 ish dollar range. So that one is definitely a recommend. Um, this is a very, very new one that we just introduced this week actually, but I actually think the Pilot 51A is a pretty decent little pen. Um, so this one is very affordable, $8, comes with a converter too. Um, so super cheap. It's got an extra fine nib, which is good for paper that you can't control the, the quality of it. Um, pretty durable, it's got a, a snap cap. It's not gonna be probably the end all be almost durable, but it's surprisingly good for the cost. 
Uh, and then um, it's got that cartridge converter. You can also eyedropper the pen if you are so inclined. You don't want to have to reload it very often, and the eyedropper is going to last forever. And it's got a metal cap too, so it's going to be pretty crush resistant if you drop it or something like that. It's going to be pretty decent. So, Jinhao uh, uh, 51A I think is worthy. Uh, Pilot Metropolitan, big fan of this pen, very durable, metal pen, very well made, snap cap. Um, you know, a comfortable pen to have in your hand. The fine nib especially is very thin uh, and the medium is pretty decent too. Ink capacity on this is not quite as great as some of the others. Um, if you have, it comes with a converter that's pretty decent. If you replace it with a Con 40, it's not quite as stellar, but um, still a decent pen. You can use Pilot cartridges with it as well. So that can be a practical option. Uh, another one that I think is pretty good if you wanna go uber cheap is go Pilot Varsity. Now, technically these are made as disposable pens and they only come in one size, medium, um, but there's a couple different colors that you can get. It writes surprisingly well for an under $4 pen. Uh, good ink capacity because it's basically an eyedropper fill. You can technically, if you want to, yank this thing out of here. Once it's empty, it's better. But you can yank the whole thing out of here and you can refill it like an eyedropper and you can keep on going. Um, so it is hackable into a reusable pen, um, but these are cheap enough where you could leave it somewhere, someone could take it or whatever, and you just wouldn't even care. You just keep on trucking. So you can buy packs of these and uh, just keep on going with them every day. Uh, what else we got? Platinum Preppy. That's another very affordable one. You can eyedropper convert these. You can get the converter. The converter costs almost twice as much as the pen itself, but it's an option. You can use uh, the uh, sorry Platinum cartridges with it too. Um, fine nib is, is again kind of fine because it's a Japanese pen, um, so it's good for most papers. The only thing about these is the cap is not the most durable thing in the world. That's the only thing I don't love about the Preppy in this specific scenario, but it's so affordable you can kind of almost treat it as a disposable pen because it costs about what a Pilot Varsity does. Um, and if you get extra life out of it, you're like, cool, that's great. Um, if you wanted to go a step up from here even, you could go with a Plazier, which is a more durable version basically of a Preppy. But you're pushing $20 with that. Uh, and then the other one that I would recommend is the Diplomat Magnum. Surprisingly good writing pen for around $20. Uh, takes standard international cartridges and converters. And it's uh, got some really cool looking colors. You know, pretty functional. I don't like the clip on this as much as I do on some of the other pens. The clip is just a little less functional. It's, it's a little flimsier and doesn't have as nice of a rounded edge to it. So if you're trying to get it in and out of your, your pocket and stuff, it's just gonna take a little more work to do that. But if you're clipping it to your paper, whatever, depending on how your setup is, it may be perfectly fine for you. Um, but I like the ink window on it. It's got that, just kind of like the Lamy does. Um, actually, all these pens that I have here have some kind of some way to tell about the ink window except for that um, Metropolitan. So really, all of these I would feel pretty comfortable um, with you using in these types of settings. Um, it's just a matter of you exactly how much you want to spend and which color and nib size and stuff like that, what other options you want. But I think these are all pretty decent ones. Good question. All right, MMCA3 on Instagram said, my pen dried out. Is it okay to suck up some ink from the bottle into the converter or am I damaging my pen? Okay, so I'm assuming your pen's dried out. You have not cleaned it. You're wondering, can you just ink it back up and like breathe new life back into the pen? Um, so if your pen dries out, it's not like the pen is dead, not by any means. In fact, there's people that have pens that have been sitting dried up in a drawer for like 15 years and they clean it out. It's a little more work to clean it out when it's been sitting that long, but they clean it out and voila, they've revived the pen. So. Dried ink does not destroy your pen, generally speaking. Um, but it's, it's not particularly great either, right? So dried ink, you know, if you're doing this technique, like you've had ink that's dried in your pen, assuming it's not an extreme like 15 year scenario, assuming it's like you just waited a little too long to clean it and now some of the inks evaporated out of it, it's kind of dried out. If you're in that scenario and it's been maybe a month or two or something like that, you're probably okay to ink that thing back up with the same ink if you do a different ink, you're gonna end up mixing it and you're gonna contaminate whatever the new ink is with whatever was left in your pen. So that's not so great. I wouldn't recommend that. And chances are, if your pen dried out, are you gonna remember what ink you had in it? Maybe you will, maybe you only have three inks and that's fine and it's easy for you to tell which one was which. Or maybe you keep accurate records of it or you just have a good memory and you know for sure. But that's the biggest thing I would question is, are you sure that you're gonna ink it up with the same ink? 
Um, but even if you do, okay, cool, that's fine. You may be able to kind of reconstitute the dye that was left in that pen, because what's gonna happen, all the water is gonna evaporate and the dye is gonna kind of be left behind. So you're gonna end up with kind of like this little crusty, um, you know, flaky kind of stuff left over of the dye. Maybe it'll look a little powdery or something like that. Um, that's, that's your dye concentrate that is left behind after all the water is evaporated out of the pen. Not the greatest thing to leave in there, but theoretically, if you reconstitute it with water, that brings it kind of back to life, sort of. So if you ink it back up with the same ink, will that be enough to reconstitute it? Maybe, maybe not 100% fully. So you just have to kind of make a judgment call on that one. But if you're in a pinch and you're like, I have absolutely nowhere to clean my pen, but I have a, a traveling inkwell that has the ink that always has the ink that I use in it, and I know if I just fill this pen again, it's probably gonna write just fine. Okay, you can do that. You can do that in a pinch. If you're at a conference or if you're doing something um, where just like, you can't just go into a hotel bathroom at a conference and clean out your pen, even though I've done that, shamelessly. Um, if you're not willing to do that, that's totally fine. Ink it back up and just give it a shot. What do you have to lose? Worst case, it doesn't flow that great. And you just, you'll have to go and clean it again anyway. And you maybe you've wasted a little bit of ink. Um, so in that scenario, I think you're fine to try it. Um, the problem is though, if you have dried up ink in your pen, the blockage could uh, cause you know, poor flow in your feed. So um, it may not get fully resaturated after refilling the pen. And you may have kind of just a, a cruddy writing experience. It may either be like super, super concentrated and be really dark and not flow great um, because of what was left in there. Or uh, it just may not flow well at all. And it may end up actually doing kind of the opposite, writing kind of stingy and dry and all that. Um, so if that's the case, obviously cleaning it is the answer. So Honestly, the best thing to do is to clean it out before you ink it up. Um, but if you don't have a choice, give it a shot. You're not going to hurt the pen. You're not going to hurt the pen. Unless it's something crazy. All right. Uh, I got a personal question. This is from Jenny by hand on Instagram. What was the very first fountain pen you ever owned? Uh, which pen was your wife's first? And did you both love pens the same or did one of you penable the other? Okay. Um, the first one I ever owned, I don't actually have it anymore because it was a pen that I made and then sold. Um, so for those of you that don't know the history of the Goulet Pen Company, uh, I started out as a pen craftsman, a pen artisan, making such wooden pens as these ones right here. This is made with, I believe this is a red Malay burl. So it looks kind of nice, kind of fancy, right? So I'd make these pens out of wood. I would have, you know, nibs on them that were just fairly nondescript. And uh, I didn't know anything about nibs. I didn't really know anything. So basically I would buy these kit pens and they would have the ability to use a rollerball kind of uh, insert on them. So I'd use like a regular rollerball refill with a grip on it. Um, or you could buy a fountain pen version of it and you would have the guts, the innards of a fountain pen. And basically the whole process of making the pen itself was exactly the same. It was just which innards you wanted to put, a rollerball or a fountain pen. Okay, so uh, I was making rollerballs for several years, uh, and then once I had uh, my my fountain pen awakening, uh, so to speak, uh, I basically I didn't have any fountain pens to buy, uh, but I wanted to get into fountain pens uh, and and at least try it out because I was like, what is that? What is it with these fountain pen people and these fountain pens? So um, I went to the DC Pen Show in 2009, bought some ink and rhodia paper. Uh, and I didn't buy any pens there because I didn't know my butt from my elbow when it came to fountain pens. Um, but I knew that I had uh, a fountain pen kit that I could replace in my own. So my first pen that I ever inked up was actually one that I created. I don't remember specifically which one and it's long been sold by now and who the heck knows. But that's kind of a cool story, right? Like the first pen I ever made was one I owned. I mean, first, <laughs> first pen I ever inked and wrote with was one I made. Ugh. That's what I was trying to say. Okay, um, but the first commercially made fountain pen that I ever owned, um, I don't know what you would consider because it was actually six pens that I bought at once. Um, and so this is when I was like in my exploratory phase. I had gone to the DC Pen Show. I was on the Fountain Pen Network. I was reading blogs, reading forums, trying to just learn what the heck was going on. And some consistent names kept coming back up, right? Some like starter pens and these types of things, um, at least in this time 10 years ago. So I bought kind of an assortment of relatively affordable pens all at once. And I wanted to try just a bunch of different things. So in my first uh, fountain pen binge, and this is when I knew that it was gonna be just dangerous for me because before I even knew anything, I was already buying bulk lots of pens pretty much. Um, so I bought a Lamy Joy because I wanted to 
um, try like a script pen. It looked interesting. I kept hearing about Lamy. Uh, had a 1.1 nib on it, which I thought looked cool. Uh, Pelican Script was another one that I bought. That was a 1.0, um, which I actually really, really liked these pens when I first started using them. Uh, Platinum Preppy, because I heard a lot about that, and the eyedropper thing, I kept reading about that. I was curious what that was all about. Um, Pelicano, this is the old version of the Pelicano too. They've been redesigned since, um, but I'd heard things about this, so I bought one of these. Uh, Pilot Petite One, which uh, we've been trying to get Pilot to bring this into the U.S. for like 10 years, um, and uh, still working on it, but uh, who knows. Surprisingly decent writing pen. It's got kind of a similar nib as to what's on the Varsity, but it's in this cute little tiny package, um, and they're pretty cheap, so um, that was kind of neat. And then uh, the Kaweco Classic Sport in the clear version, uh, because I wanted to try eyedropper conversion on this as well, and people kept talking about it being a good pocket pen. So those were all the first pens. I honest to goodness don't remember which one I inked up first out of these, but um, you know, I kind of bought them all at once and just inked them all up and started using them right away, and thus the pen frenzy began for the young Brian Goulet. Um, going to Rachel, since you asked what was her first pen that she used, um, because I bought this lot of pens, I was definitely the pen enabler uh, for her. She would never have used a fountain pen, probably. Um, had it not been for uh, my going down that path. Um, so the Petite One, we had a pink one, uh, I think, that uh, that she used and I think subsequently has, has disappeared over the last 10 years. But um, anyway, so she kind of commandeered that one because she was like, oh, this is cute and it's mine now. And I was like, okay, cool, that's fine. That's why I bought a lot. Um, so she started using that. She, actually still really likes that pen. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's what she first started using. And then over time, she started to use more and more, but I was definitely more of the one who was the user. Um, so did we both love pens the same or did one of us pen able the other? Rachel definitely loves pens, like there's no question about that, but I love them very hard. So it kind of sets a tough standard. Um, plus I'm very kinesthetic, I'm very hands-on. Um, and so I just, I, I love touching and fiddling with the pens. Obviously I made pens, so like, I obviously just have very much an affinity towards them. So my collection is roughly 10 times the size of hers, but she has some really nice pens. So, um, you know, she's more of a quality over quantity and I'm a quality, quantity, whatever, give it all to me. You know, that's kind of my vibe. Um, but she's definitely loved like the business side of pens and just being in this business, we, us supporting each other. She's loved me, she's loved using pens. So, um, you know, I'm probably a little more into the actual writing and using of pens than she is and just that whole process. But she definitely uses pens on a very regular basis. That's by far her go-to and um, she loves it very much. Um, but, you know, I have, I've pushed her down the rabbit hole, but I am like down the rabbit hole, like aerodynamically, you know, like when you see people skydiving and they like, they, they straighten themselves out and turn upside down so they go as fast as possible down. That's me going down the fountain pen rabbit hole. She's probably a little more just like free falling down the rabbit hole, you know, catching a little more air so she's not falling quite as fast, maybe pulling her chute every now and then. And me, I'm just like full stream aerodynamics flying down that rabbit hole. <laughs> There's a good visual for you. All right, I got a few business questions for you. This one's from Glenn M on Facebook. It seems like all hobbies have ebbs and flows. For instance, vinyl records are really having a resurgence right now. Where do you think the fountain pen, ink, and paper are at these days? Is it a high tide moment or are we in an upswing or downturn? I actually had a couple of Q&A questions that were along this vibe this week of like the, hey, what do you think is the future of the fountain pens? And you know, do you think that it's still gonna be on the rise and all this kind of stuff? Um, you know, in my view, and this is only my view, this is there's not a lot of good data out there because it's such a niche industry, to be quite honest with you. Um, there's really not a definitive answer. I would say kind of yes and no. I think it's changing, you know, because it's 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 niche, niche niche, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's a lot of different kind of pockets of interest of fountain pens uh, that can even occur, and it's kind of evolving. It's constantly evolving. Um, I think for pen online pen retail, like what we do is on the upswing, like much of all online retail, right? Especially for the hobby kind of sector. Um, there's, a, there's a resurgence of fountain pens because of online, because of social media, because of the education, video, and these types of things that we can do. There's an upswing on that. Brick and mortars, 
maybe not so much, you know, especially if it's like a stationary store that's in a shopping mall that's declining, that's, you know, um, there's a lot of brick and mortar stores that are getting hit hard right now and fountain pen stores are not immune to that. So I think brick and mortar stores are having a little more trouble especially if they're a strictly brick and mortar model. There are definitely some successful brick and mortar stores, especially when they couple them with social media and online and these types of things. Um, but I think as an entire industry across the board, um, it's probably softening a little bit in the brick and mortar side, not on the upswing, uh, I guess. I think in some countries it's booming and in other countries it's retracting. I think, you know, and this is again where I don't have a, a super good sense. I think in general, in the US, it's slightly on the incline across the board. But again, you have some new up and coming companies, new up and coming stores that are really doing well and others that are really not doing well. So even that, there's a lot of movement uh, when, you, when you really get in and look at it. Um, established brands, I think, are having a somewhat tougher time. Um, like I'm talking long established, like the Cross, Schaefer, Waterman, Parker, these ones that like have been around for, I mean, literally 100 years or more. They're having somewhat harder time because um, maybe they haven't been innovating quite as much. They're maybe relying more on a gifting crowd, which in the U.S. is not as much. Other places like China and stuff like that, like they're booming. Like I think Parker's like number one in China, but not they're like not even on most people's minds anymore other than like vintage for what they used to do. But like modern Parkers and stuff is just not what it used to be in the U.S. Um, so some of that has been changing and is not necessarily on the upswing. Um, I think newer brands like Noodlers, Twisbees, a lot of independent pen makers, things like that, they're on the rise in the U.S. for sure, especially we love entrepreneurs. So like anybody that's like innovating and coming up with new stuff, like that totally feeds into the whole vibe of, you know, social media and education and getting excitement and FOMO and everything. Like it's just, it just really feeds into that. Like we love the underdog. We love the, you know, Cinderella story kind of thing. So anything that plugs into that in the U.S. is going to be like, yeah. Let's do that. Um, so that's kind of cool. But all in all, I think the rise of communication um, education has helped to bring a lot more awareness with the fountain pen industry. I am very bullish on it, but being realistic, it is a kind of a mature market. And with so many things working against it, such as cursive writing not being taught in schools much anymore, and, um, you know, just technology and even social media itself, you could argue, is keeping people from communicating in the same written form that it has been. I think it's yet to be seen where it's finally going to land in terms of handwriting and just in general writing things down. Um, that is going to change. And I, I don't think that all of a sudden we're going to be like, you know what? We don't need smartphones anymore. We don't need voice technology. We don't need video conferences. Letters. Let's go back to letters. Let's do that all the time now. Like it had its heyday, that was its time, just like fax machi machines had their heyday, and now they are more or less irrelevant, right? And smartphones are having their heyday. Smartphones are going to become irrelevant at some point, right? So like it's going to shift, it's going to evolve. Fountain pens, as much as I love them and I want them to exist and be meaningful and fruitful to as many people as possible, they are just not the utility de facto anymore. Right? That was the case in the early 1900s. Hasn't been the case for quite some time. So it remains a passion item for all of us who are watching or producing this video. And I'm okay with that. I'm realistic that it's not going to like, everyone in the world's gonna use a fountain pen. No, that's not realistic. But we can still nurture this community and still give, um, you know, support to all the makers who still want to carry on the legacy and are really passionate about these pens, we can have this nice, sweet little safe haven of the internet and safe heaven of our little lives by having these cool little products. And for me to be a part of that is extremely rewarding. For you to be a part of that has got to be pretty cool too. Um, but yeah, so I think, I think in general, like, is it going to rise or fall or whatever? It's like, if it rises, it's going to rise a little bit, but not, it's not going to go crazy. I don't think you know, for example, like vinyl records, I don't think fountain pens are going to go as mainstream as that because frankly, they're just, they're just a lot of work. Like they're more work than vinyl records. Um, but oh, maybe that's not true. I don't have vinyl records, so I don't know how much work they are to maintain and all that kind of stuff. I could be misspoken there, but my assumption is that it's a little more work and th that work just kind of keeps people, unless they're really passionate about it, from kind of wanting to do it. So anyway, but either way, I think it's, I, I am, I am wanting to be part of the upswing and I'm doing everything I can to, to help make that happen. Cool. I'm gonna take one second.
for a little swig of water here. It is like torrential downpour outside. I don't know if y'all can hear the thunder, but it's crazy. I'm like shaking in my boots over here because it's it's like dark outside. It's like Armageddon. Anyway, um, I'm sure it'll be fine. It just won't be a fun drive home. <laughs> Lindsay C on Facebook says, I've noticed most pen designers and makers seem to be men. Do you carry any pens designed by women? Would love to support them. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a big fan of women makers as well. Uh, and I wanted to highlight them even though, oh my gosh, I can like hear like the roof and everything. Wow, it is crazy rain. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pumped to see so many women that are into pens. I think even in general, just the landscape of the pen community has been much more embracing and welcoming towards women, just as my observations have happened in the last 10 years. I go to a pen show now, or I look at social media or whatever, and it's just like, it seems much more balanced. Whereas it probably used to be a little more, or at least to me, it felt like a little more of a boys club. And I never really liked that vibe. And I wanted to really have like pens for everybody kind of vibe going on, which is cool because I'm seeing that a lot more now. And I'm like, great. I don't know that that's necessarily the case for makers. I think it's, um, you know, probably a little bit of legacy kind of stuff going on there. Um, I, I do get to interact with a decent number of pen designers and stuff like that. Some of them though, like I don't necessarily know exactly who's designing pens, especially at the larger companies. You know, a lot of them are behind the scenes and they're not really public. Like obviously if you have a company like Pen Eider and you know Dante's the designer and like that's a big deal. So like he gets a lot of attention and all that kind of stuff. That makes sense. I'm just realizing I didn't bring an umbrella inside. Wow, that's gonna suck for me. Anyway, totally irrelevant. But um, where was I going? I get very distracted here. It's really crazy rain out there. Anyway, so the um, the manufacturers, I don't necessarily know who's behind all of them. So some of them, you know, I'm going to make the assumption that they're probably predominantly male at some of these larger companies, um, especially it depends on what country they're from. They may have different levels of progression towards women in certain roles and things like that. I think generally speaking in terms of just engineering and, and stuff like that in general, especially in the U.S., tends to be predominantly male. I would make the assumption that's probably going to be predominantly male uh, in the pen industry, j just as it would be for perhaps other industries. But again, I don't have hard numbers around that stuff, especially at the larger companies. So I don't want to dwell too much on that. I want to bring um, into conversation the fact that I would love to see more women uh, being involved in this. Um, my wife and I, we run this company together. She has as much, probably more input <laughs> into how pens should be designed because she has really good taste um, than I do <laughs> around here. So I am very much in support of that because I think like, heck yeah, we're going to make better pens and it's going to serve a more diverse group in the community. I think that's awesome. Um, but you know, it's something that uh, hasn't necessarily been like on the forefront of the conversation in the community. So I just thought it was cool to highlight this question. So again, I'm not, I'm not saying this because I have a perfect answer here, but I just want to, I want to participate in the conversation. So I'm giving rise to that and putting myself out there just a little bit um, as, as a dude in the industry, um, bringing light to some, some cool ladies who are making some stuff. So, um, you know, if it's bigger companies like Pilot, Lamy, Pelican, I don't have a clue who designs those pens, unless it's like Lamy does a collaboration with somebody, you know, outside their company, they might highlight who that individual is. Um, but that would be kind of cool. Maybe I should mention a Lamy, like they should have, they should have a lady designer design some of their pens. That would be cool. Um, but there are a lot of women that are involved in the various pen companies that we're dealing with. It's not like it's just all dudes, right? So I don't know specifically the designing and engineering aspect because that's kind of like a, a, a an inner sanctum kind of within most of these pen companies. Um, you know, so they keep that kind of close to the chest and even me being in the industry, I don't always know like exactly who's designing these pens. Um, but uh, I know that we interact with a lot of people who are in various parts of the company um, various levels within it who are women and uh, maybe aren't like notable individuals publicly um, but it is it is definitely um, something that I think is getting better um, so let's see here uh, some ones that I wanted to specifically highlight most of the ones that I know that are um, really kind of like the women are, are out there and known a little bit more which is cool um, are some of the smaller more independent companies um, especially if it's like husband and wife kind of working together you know, they both very much have a hand in it. I can say from my wife and I starting our company, 
like one would not happen without the other. Like for as much credit as I get for what happens around here, like Rachel 100% deserves credit too. And that is absolutely the case for like a lot of our co-design, co-branded designs and stuff that we have done. Um, Rachel is definitely the X factor there. So specifically some of the pen makers that we've got, um, Edison pens. So Andrea Gray works right alongside Brian Gray. I mean, literally she's like working alongside. She's full-time in it. That is both of their full-time jobs. They're both designing pens together, sanding them together, polishing them together, like fitting nibs on everything. They're doing it together. Um, so very much of a collaborative kind of thing. Andrea Gray's got a lot of input. You'll see them at pen shows together and stuff like that. She just, in her own personality, tends to step back a little bit and isn't as much on the forefront, branding-wise, as Brian Gray is. Um, and that's just her kind of personal choice. Knowing her, she's a great gal, but she doesn't want as much of that limelight, so doesn't steal as much of that attention away. But um, she certainly could and would be deserving to do so. Um, but Brian just, uh, is out there a little bit more. Um, Benu is another one, kind of a new one. Um, so Benu, again, they're in Russia. I haven't met everybody. I haven't even seen any pictures of anybody. We've been dealing just over email, really. Um, but uh, I know, and for the sake of anonymity, where I can say who we work with at Benu, but I know that um, the Benu Titan that we have here, uh, this pen uh, wouldn't have happened without the lady that we collaborated with uh, to make that happen. And it was very much a collaboration back and forth going through all the different aspects of it. She's explaining, you know, the design and various aspects um, rather technically about what's going to work and what's not going to. So I know that Banu um, definitely has um, some lady power there in their design. This is Edison pen, by the way. Um, this is a good one that uh, uh, Andrea Gray was uh, helpful with. Uh, another good one that I wanted to give mention to. We don't actually sell this brand, um, kind of a small independent manufacturer, um, Scriptorium. So Renee Meeks at Scriptorium, she'll do a bunch of pen shows. So you may see her, you may have seen stuff on Instagram. So this is a Scriptorium pen that Rachel has uh, of hers. So she does a lot of cool stuff. She does a lot of one-offs and really kind of custom pieces and stuff like that. Um, but she does some great work um, and a lady out there in the industry. And then another one that I have is um, Carol Share from uh, Canalea pens. So Carol and Hugh are great people. They both work hand in hand. I don't know specifically like who designs which pen or whatever. I'm sure again it's kind of a collaborative thing just like uh, with the Grays with Edison but you know Carol is right there uh, with Hugh uh, doing Canalea. So um, good people to support there even though with Scriptorium and Canalea we have no affiliation other than we're fans of their work and we think they're great people. Um, but we have no affiliation with them. We don't sell their products but you know for, sur for sure I would highly recommend them. You can check them out. So, um, and then, you know, lastly, I kind of alluded to this, but I think one of the most influential ladies <laughs> is actually Rachel. Uh, you know, all of the brands that we work with, Rachel is, is basically the ultimate decider about what we carry uh, here at Gulli Pens. Uh, anytime we have vendor meetings or visits or we go somewhere, whatever, um, Rachel is like the one that everybody wants to see. I, I get the FaceTime and the, the, you know, whatever, that attention, but when it comes down to like picking products, um, choosing colors, you know, designing things. Rachel has got that on lock. So um, she's really the, the lady that makes it all happen. Again, even Rachel, she doesn't want the limelight as much as I do. I, I don't mind the limelight. Um, but still, when it comes to designing stuff, yeah, she is in it for sure. All right, let me jump in here real quick. This is actually the day after. After I shot Q&A, which is what you're watching right now, I remembered two more women in the pen world that I couldn't believe that I left out, but I wanted to definitely mention uh, Shu Jen from Tatia. So Tatia is completely uh, woman run. Shu Jen founded it, started it, did the whole thing. So she's very, like, not only instrumental, but like, is that whole brand. So she is awesome. Uh, we don't sell that, uh, sell Tatia, but. Uh, Sailor actually owns part of Tatcha now, or Atoya does at least. Um, so definitely uh, worth checking out and a lady uh, who's making some waves in the pen world. Um, and then Elizabeth Brooks. So that is uh, the better half of Jonathan Brooks from Carolina Pens, another independent pen maker. Um, I don't know 100% to the degree that Elizabeth is involved in the actual pen design compared to Jonathan, but the two of them, they're working hard together, working as a team, just like Rachel and I did in the early days, you know, working out of the house and that kind of thing. So uh, I know for sure Carolina Pens would not be where they are without Elizabeth. So a couple of other awesome ladies that I wanted to work in here, did not want to leave them out. There may be others, but those two came to mind. So there you go. All right, back to gray shirt, Brian. So there you go. Some of the ladies of the pen industry. If there are others that should be highlighted, um, please let me know because I would love to um, give some attention to our ladies of the pen world.
Um, and just like Rachel, I'm sure there are other um, ladies who are maybe at other retailers that, you know, we don't like broadcast every single pen that we ever design or have input on or whatever. Um, but like every vendor meeting that we have, we're constantly telling them like, do these, have these types of grip sections, have these types of colors, have these types of things. This is what women want. This is, you know, in general, um, you know, not everything can be sliced and diced that easily, but we're trying to get like well-rounded representation of the pen community across in gen, maybe not even towards a specific product, but just trying to like pound that drum and get that back to the manufacturers of like, this is what people want to see. So, and I'm sure other retailers are doing the same kind of thing. So um, there may be people who are kind of like in Rachel's position that are having influence over the types of products that are designed. Um, in general, maybe if not specifically. All right, and last question I have for this week is Emilio Villages, uh, Emilio Villegas, 24 on Instagram. Uh, would you pass your business operations down to your kids, assuming they would like to, or hire a new manager when it's time? Uh, when it's time, you know, I'm 35 years old, I figure I have a little bit of time, you never know, anything can happen. But uh, in general, um, you know, I, my, my end goal is to kind of work myself out of a job. <laughs> I want to raise up others. I want to build the company. I want to um, essentially have it to be where if something were to happen to me, the whole thing would not crumble away into dust. Um, I think that's much more likely for Rachel than for me. I think what I do is fairly, um, uh, you know, replaceable. Not really, but you know what I mean. Um, so I would love to pass it on to my kids one day. You know, am I going to do this for a long, long time? I am hoping I get the opportunity to do that. Um, but, you know, my kids are seven and nine. So I am starting to think about that a little bit because as my kids are no longer like, you know, dropping bags of Cheerios in their shoes and stuff like that, um, you know, they're, they're getting more and more capable of doing some actual like, you know, functional human things. Uh, I'm starting to think more about that kind of stuff, like what type of um, humans uh, are Rachel and I raising here and what what is their character going to be like what kind of traits are they going to have what kind of work ethic are we going to instill in them how are we going to nurture them to be functional human beings when they are no longer under our purview so thinking about that kind of stuff very much in general uh, but then uh, thinking about it in the context of this company certainly it's a family business and I'm thinking about are they going to want to be here? Their last name is part of this company, so uh, are they ultimately going to be on here? The thing that I absolutely don't want is for them to feel some kind of obligation to have to work here, especially if their heart is not in it. I don't want that for anybody in, my, in this company. Like, I don't want any team member that we have here who doesn't have their heart in what we're doing to feel obligated to be here. Like, and as crazy as that sounds, I love our team and I want everybody to be happy and successful here. But the last thing I want is for somebody to feel like they have to be here and have no other option. And then just like kind of just die inside and be a shell of themselves doing work around here. Like life is too short, like please no. Um, and that would especially be the case for my kids. Like if my kids grow up and they, you know, want to be a scientist or they want to be a you know, nonprofit entrepreneur or they want to be a beekeeper like great like I want them to be happy I want them to put the most of themselves into whatever they do uh, and be realistic and content and intentional I think those are the things that I'm trying to instill in my kids whether or not that happens here I want this to be an option for them but even still, it's not like they're going to graduate high school at 18 and I'll be like, okay, you're now the, I'm passing the crown down and you're now an 18 year old who doesn't know that much that's going to have to run this company with dozens and dozens of people in it. That's not going to happen. So I'm going to work with my kids, give them, you know, steps towards, you know, opportunities to grow and learn. Part of the thing that I love about this company and that I loved about growing up in my parents' business when I was a kid. I had opportunities working in a family business to do some elevated type of work uh, that I probably would not have had, um, especially at the ages that I had. I was working with my parents' business at 7, 9, 10, 12, you know, for like spring breaks, summers, these types of things. Uh, you know, weekends when my parents had the business in the house, we would work weekends and stuff like that. Um, I got opportunities to get a diversity of different experiences and skills of work. Um, got to have some independence and autonomy managing certain projects and stuff like that, that no one would have ever given me the opportunity at age, you know, nine to manage a little segment of my own business. But my parents let me do that. You know, I got to inventory 
you know, brochures and stuff. My parents were in the desktop publishing business, so they would do graphic design type stuff, and we'd print brochures and these types of things. So we would have like brochures for franchises where, um, you know, we would we would have the brochure in general printed up, and we'd have to like overprint whatever the local franchise was. So we would get orders from the franchisees for um, whatever the company was, um, and I would have to go in and find the file with the address and and overprint and run them all through the printer and package them all up and manage the inventory. Like I had to do, I was doing that stuff at like nine and ten, which makes me think like now like my son is nine and like he's not doing that kind of stuff so <laughs> he's doing different stuff but anyway so uh you know that's the kind of stuff that i got to do uh as a kid so i kind of want that for my own kids just so that they have the opportunity to learn to work and do cool stuff like that um you know and and so we're going to raise them with some opportunities like that here but it's also different like you know, my parents were running the business out of, literally out of the house with just the two of them or maybe one employee at that point. Um, but we have like 40 people here and I'm like, oh, that's a little, it's a little more complicated here. I can't just like bring my seven year old into this office as easily and kind of like let her do whatever she wants. Um, you know, it's a little, little different now. So we'll like bring work home. We'll have them do stuff there, but um, you know, that would be cool. I think in the, in the big picture, it would be cool to work together with my kids that was not like my end goal dream when doing this though it wasn't to build a business that my kids would one day run if that happens like great the meritocracy of that will play out if they are qualified have the passion want to grow i will invest as much into them as they can handle to make that happen because they're my kids and i love them and i wow well, that's who i am anyway i want to push i want to challenge i want to grow people but uh if they're not ready for it if they're not passionate for it if they're not skilled for it the worst thing to do would be to put them in a position where they can't be successful. And then for them to feel guilty about that, to hate it, to resent me, that's just not a good situation. The company wouldn't be as healthy. I'm not gonna do that. So if that's the case, I would definitely raise up somebody else um, or you know, get someone you know, from the outside to manage things better if the time came where that situation happened. Um, I'm not looking to step out of things anytime soon, but you never know what could happen. And uh, I wouldn't wanna throw my kids into anything that they're not ready for. So if that seems to be the opportunity, I would, give them lots of chances to prove their worth, put it that way, uh, to the point where anyone who would be perhaps one day under their purview would feel that they really earned it and have that same respect and not just like, oh, this is Brian's kid, so I have to do what he says. That's not gonna fly. That's not, that's not how it's gonna go down. Um, so yeah, I, and then just in general, like uh, our kids, they're certainly being raised knowing like what the Gulli Pen Company is, knowing that the food that is on our table comes from the pen community and what we do here. Um, so even if they don't end up working in it, they're gonna have a respect for what goes on here uh, for the writing community and all that. So that's kind of the bare minimum. Um, but you know, they're kind of excited. Like they have little projects they've done at school where it's like, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And they're like, I wanna work at the Gulli Pen Company. Like genuinely, we didn't like, implant that into them but they just see like the environment we have here and it's, it seems very appealing to them in some degree and they just love us as parents and they're still in kind of that magical age where we're their heroes um, I'm hoping that doesn't ever wear off but realistically once we get to that like preteen phase I, I know it may not uh, always be like you know rose-colored glasses us as parents to them but you know I'm enjoying that phase right now as they're in it so my question of the week for this week as we close things out here is as a kid what did you want to be when you grow up? Or if you are a kid right now, what do you actually want to be when you grow up? Or maybe you are grown up, but you don't feel like you've grown up. So you may still have an answer for what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, me personally, I had a couple of different answers. The one that I had the most that seems the funniest, but actually, you know, wasn't too crazy is uh, I loved video games when I was younger. Shocking. What nine or 10 year old boy didn't love video games back in the 90s. Um, so I wanted to be a video game tester. That was what I conceived in my brain as was a thing that existed. Um, so I didn't want to develop video games or come up with them or anything like that. My, go my job was just to play them a lot. And in my mind, I literally I remember this, like in my mind, you would get paid $10 an hour just to play video games and test new video games that were being developed. I don't know, I wasn't anticipating having to give a lot of feedback or anything, but just test them and make sure they're good. $10 an hour, and $10 an hour to me was like, I couldn't conceive what to do with that kind of money. So that was my master plan um, around age 10. Uh, and then later on, I kind of like forgot uh, about having a career and then and then ultimately I wanted to go into the military so I was thinking of going into the army up until I was uh, 17 so that was kind of my plan deviated quite a bit from that got into real estate a little bit got my degree in real estate 
was a realtor for like two months, got out of it, started power washing houses with my dad, started making pens, and now I'm running an e-commerce pen business. So there you go, kids. For anybody that <laughs> thinks that you need to have everything figured out, you don't. Um, but anyway, those were my dreams and aspirations that I had as a kid. So I would love to hear what you had, just as kind of a fun little thing. Um, you can check out a lot of the pens that I talked about here on gouletpens.com or other various places that I may have mentioned. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. Again, I'm taking off next week, so I will miss you, but I will be thinking about you. And I, you can re-listen to any of the other 256 Q&As we've done up to this point or watch some of the other content that we put out. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're having a good end of the school year if you happen to be nearing that. I know next week is the last week of school for our kids, and they could not be happier. Even though they have a good school year, they're still very excited to have summer happen. And we are excited, too, for the change of the season. So... Thank you so much for watching and right on.